when I started my career in gastroenterology, it was the mid-80s. Uh, there are no slides. No, but what about the audience? Uh, so uh, I was looking, you know, where, where to point. So when I started my career in... <laughs> when I started my career in the 1980s, um, if you wanted to buy a car, then you had just two options, the good old ambassador and the Fiat. And uh, the choice was very much similar if you were treating IBD. So you had a choice between salzopyrin and you had a choice between uh, steroids, mainly for the first part of the inductions. And if you failed both these drugs, then you went to the third S, which was surgery. And in Circu 2015, we've come a long way uh, not only in the far, uh, as, as the number of cars that are available in India. In fact, there would be so many, but I've just put them there. And this has been a slow journey. It's taken almost maybe four, four decades. And today, <clears throat> we have, you know, a, a much wider choice than what we had in the early 80s. And of course, salicy salicylates form the base of this pyramid. Then we go on to steroids, the biologicals, biosimilars, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, immunomodulators, and last we have surgery. So that's been the paradigm shift. And as uh, Prime Minister Modi said this morning, the way to Indian reform Indian economy is not a sprint, it's a marathon, and I think the same is applied here. We've gone, it has taken us almost four decades before, before we have developed these drugs. <clears throat> and the reason why this has happened is we are now much more wiser about the patho pathobiology of IBD. I'm not saying that we've, we've completed the complete jigsaw puzzle, but yes, most of the pieces are there. We know the role of the gut mycobacteria, especially in Crohn's disease, the immune dysregulation, the role of the T cells, macrophages produce TNF, and most of the cytokines, IL-2, IL-6, etc. So the, the, the jigsaw puzzle, puzzle is really getting um, almost near completion, but we still have some critical phases left. So in summary, it's a better understanding of the pathophysiology that has led us to the development of these new drugs. And to explain pathophysiology of IBD, uh, let me take you back to, to some, some of you at least would have read the story of Don Quixote and uh, his, his man Friday, Sancho Panza. So here Don Quixote is telling him, Sancho, that can you look at the dragon with the arms waving around and spewing venom and he's talking about windmills. So he was always fighting imaginary enemies. So as far as the pathobiology of IBD is concerned, I think, in my perspective, I view it as a psychiatric disorder. Yes, you heard it right. I think it's a psychiatric disorder because the T cells and the immune effector cells have lost their mind. They cannot distinguish between friend and foe. They cannot distinguish between commensal and pathogen, and they just start attacking. And that's what happens. And the victim is the gut epithelium. That's, that, that, that gets destroyed. So when we look at molecular pathophysiology, there is a balance. There is a balance between pro-inflammatory pro mediators, mainly IL-2, IL-6, TNF, etc., and the anti-inflammatory mediators, which is TGF and IL-10, and they keep things in balance. It's, it's a closed kind of uh, system, uh, and the local inflammation remains. So that's what we see if you take a biopsy of the intestine, you see a lot of inflammatory cells. But this doesn't lead to disease as such. But when we go to IBD, then this balance is totally tilted in favor of the pro-inflammatory mediators. The principal one that we deal with most of the time is TNF. And there's a decrease in the anti-inflammatory mediators leading to inflammation and ultimately the patient develops IBD. And the pathophysiology of this can be explained in two phases. The first is the vascular phase in which there is lymphocyte activation and their entry at the target. Now how do I explain this? So when there is a war going on, you know, the army has these recruitment camps 
and you increase the number of recruits you're taking. So similarly, similarly, the body perceives gut inflammation as a war going on in the intestine, in the colon, and they have these recruitment sites, and the lymphocytes and monocytes, they're upregulated, their volume increases, the numbers increase. And that's the first part. And then they have to be sent to the front, like soldiers have to be sent to the front, then they have to be sent to the target where the infl inflammation is going on. So that's the second part of the story. And they reach the human colon, which is the target. And from there, they'll permeate into the lamina propria, into the mucosa, and cause inflammatory bowel disease. So that, in short, in a nutshell, would be the pathophysiology. The vascular phase I'm going to be talking about because that will come when we develop drugs specifically. So there, as you would have remembered, some of you at least would remember, uh, uh, this is probably was taught in the first prof that you can have these neutrophils, they, how they go. There are four phases. The same applies to the lymphocytes. The first one is the tethering or the rolling. The second one is the firm adhesion. The third is the transmigration. And finally, the migration as shown over here. Now, you have to view the lymphocyte. It looks like a marble. But on the surface of a marble, there, there are these hooks kind of things. And normally, it should pass through the endothelium. It should pass through the capillaries. But when there's inflammation, then by the activity of the chemokines, there are these adhesion molecules. So the hooks on the surface of the lymphocytes, they bind to these adhesion molecules. And the hook is given the name of alpha-4, beta-7 integrin. It attaches to the MADCAM, which is on the endothelium, and then it transmigrates, and that's how colonic inflammation uh, occurs. So what can you do? So one way is to take away all these inflammatory cells. So these recruits, which are going there to the war, to the front, you take them away. And this is known as leukocytophoresis, which means to withdraw the leukocytes, to take them away, make them pass through a filter into a column, and just isolate them from the blood. And, and this, this process is not new. It was known from the time of Hippocrates. But it was actually used for the treatment of CML, because here in CML you can have a count of 50,000, 70,000, or something like that. And finally, in Crohn's disease in 1985, it was acknowledged as, as a treatment modality. So you can take away these lymphocytes, you can, you can take away the monocytes, the neutrophils, and isolate them from the bloodstream so that they don't reach the target. So this slide shows you what leukocytophoresis does. The first one on your extreme left, you can see is the lymphocytes, and they are not much changed. The lymphocytes are not changed. The platelets, that's on the, this column is the inflow, this is the outflow. So you can see the platelets are reduced a little bit. But look what's happening to the monocytes and look what, what's happening to the macrophages. They are the ones, principal cells, the neutrophils that really come down. So you're taking away these cells, these cells which are actively involved in inflammation, you just take them away and put them in the column and the blood is recirculated back into the, in, in, into the body. And from a histological point of view, this is what it looks like. So you can see this is a crypt abscess. There are a lot of, you can see neutrophils, eosinophils, all these cells are there. And after you've done your leukocytophoresis, it's a much quieter place and healing has started occurring. So this, unfortunately, however, although the, the concept seems to be excellent, the only country which seems to be doing this is Japanese. And nobody else has shown success with leukocytophoresis, but, but the idea, the concept is absolutely physiological. I'm going to spend just two minutes on this NF-kappa-B because Dr. Kastliwal has already told you about the NF-kappa-B. It plays a central role even in colonic inflammation. And the colonic inflammation, the NF-kappa-B is right here. It, it is bound to the inflammatory IKB, which is the inhibitor. And unless it goes into the nucleus, where it causes transcription and pro-inflammatory cytokines. And now in the next five, six slides, I'm going to be talking about the new drugs and the emerging options that are now currently available. So I've got this slide over here which says the smart bomb. The smart bomb was uh, introduced in possibly in the Gulf War, where you could actually control, this man is going to control this bomb, 
And you know, you can target it precisely where you want it. So if you want to send it to an absolutely point A, it goes right there. And it had the ability that it can distinguish military targets from civilian targets. And the same concept has actually been taken in, in the newer drug delivery systems. So for example, this delayed release 5 ASA is precise targeting into the ileum, where, into the colon, because once it reaches a pH 7, that's where it wants to hit the target. Otherwise, look at the structure of this. This is the entry coating. It has a matrix, and these granules, in the active drug are in these granules. So when the pH becomes 7, that is somewhere in the distal ileum, that's when they're going to get released, and you deliver the drug precisely where you want it into the colon. So that's the precise drug targeting. And from that, now we on to Greek mythology. Some of you would know what a chimera is. A chimera is a fusion of more than one, uh, more than two species. So the Greeks thought of this, and they had this uh, fantasy about this animal, which is a lion, a goat, a dragon, and it has the tail of a serpent. And that's how we got the idea of chimeric molecules in IBD. And the prime example of this is the infleximab, which is 25% mouse, 75% human. And we moved on. So now we've gone on to adalimumab, which is 100% uh, human, humanized monoclonal antibodies. And the advantage of this is it, it has no adverse reactions related to the cross species between mouse and man. Today, biologicals are the standard of care for moderate and severe ulcerative colitis, as shown by the ACT-1 and the ACT-2 uh, trials. The primary endpoint of this was a clinical response at week eight, and this occurred approximately in about two-thirds or 66 percent of the patient. They also lead to a sustained remission at 52 weeks. So currently, they are the, they are the standard of care. If the patient fails steroids, then automatically you have a choice between cyclosporin or biologicals. But in India, we are reluctant to use infleximab. And, and this slide I've taken from the I, ISG task force, which I was a member. It was published about three years ago. And you can see that this is ulcerative colitis. And of all the patients with ulcerative colitis in India, less than 1%, in fact, 0.3% is the total population of UC patients which have been exposed to infleximab. Uh, Crohn's disease slightly better, 2.2 percent. Despite the fact that about 40 percent of our patients would have severe disease, we are very reluctant to use this drug. And why is that so? Yes, cost. They, 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 these are all, until the biosimilars came, the cost was a major issue. It still is a major issue. And the other reason is the fear of precipitating tuberculosis. So the cost of therapy, 30,000 for one while, just one while, and the average dose is five milligram per kilogram, so you have a patient who weighs 70 kg, 350 milligram, that's almost four vials, so that tells you the cost of just the first induction therapy is going to be more than one lakh. And of course, there's some of the states in India, the per capita income, you know, Bihar is somewhere between 12,000, that's the per capita income. So that's the problem with us. Because of uh, our low per capita income, we can hardly afford these drugs. But more importantly is the fear that it may precipitate tuberculosis. And the reason for this is when you have tuberculosis, the tuberculosis is kept into containment by these uh, epithelial, by the lymphocytes, and TNF plays a ma major role in that. When you give a drug, which is anti-TNF, this granuloma breaks and you get disseminated tuberculosis and this has been shown uh, by Keen study which was published about 10 years ago and we have recently finished our trial which was a multicentric study in at least three centers of India and you'd be shocked to know that anti-TNF therapy is associated with flaring up of tuberculosis in almost 8% of the patients. But unlike the West, we know how to handle tuberculosis, and unlike the Western data, we didn't have any mortality. So that's the plus point that we have. We manage our tuberculosis much better than the West. But in some cases, the infleximab doesn't work. 
The obvious reason for that is, of course, antibodies, but that will occur later on. In those patients who have low serum albumin, it doesn't work. But interestingly, in about 30% of the patient, it won't work because of something else. And this has recently been found out in a very recent article that this is because of increased MMP. And the MMM, MMP is an endopeptidase which destroys the matrix. It has a, you know, it has a penchant for, uh, for collagen. It just likes to eat collagen. And another property that it has is it destroys the infleximab. So MMPs destroy the infleximab. So this gives us an opportunity. If you have a drug which can inhibit the MMPs, then the infleximab would work much better and we'd get better results. There is a recently a drug that has come, which is an MMP inhibitor, but I think it would still be time before this is going to be used for IBD. This is the other drug. I was talking about isolating uh, the cells from the blood. You can use a column, which is leukocytophoresis, or you can use a, a drug called vidolizumab. So this is, again, a monoclonal antibody which is directed against the alpha-4 beta-7 integrins. And you can see that these are the, the lymphocytes. So because if you have an antibody which is against the alpha-4 beta-7, which is the hook, then these permeation into the, into the submucosa and into the lamina propria would be, would, would, wouldn't happen. I'll just briefly touch on uh, calcineurin inhibitors, which act over here. So when there is an antigen-presenting cell, it binds on the T-cell receptor, increases calcium. And this is what requires calcineurin. Now, calcineurin inhibitors are tacrolimus, tacrolimus I've shown over here, and cyclosporin. Now, again, we've talked about, Dr. Kastliwal talked about NF-kappa B, and we have an identical twin called nf at which is nuclear factor for activated T lymphocytes. And this, the moment it becomes dephosphorylated, it can enter the cell into the nucleus and cause transcription of IL-2, which is a very, very active pro-inflammatory cytokine. So we can have interference over here, and these are the standard drugs that are now used for those patients who don't respond to steroids. The last couple of slides, the other pathway that which we can intervene is through the JAK-STAT pathway. This is again, we have a cytokine receptor here. You can see the JAK. Now the JAK donates its phosphorus group into the STAT. And this is something like a disco. Now in some most discotheques, you have a rule that as a stud, as a single person, you cannot enter. So STAT cannot enter as a single person. It has to get dimerized. And it gets dimerized because of the phosphorus that it gets from the JAK and then it goes into the nucleus, and of course, then again the transcription starts. So if you have a drug which blocks the JAK here, and the JAK cannot donate its phosphorus, then the STAT cannot get activated. And the drug that we have for this is tofacitinib. This was an article that appeared in the NEGM about three years ago. It's an oral drug, and you can see the efficacy is again almost 60%. It hasn't been launched in India as yet, but it's likely to come in the near future. And lastly, the, our Prime Minister has been talking about make in India and make in India. So we finally have a drug uh, for IBD, which is derived from curcumin, which all of you would know is, is, is in what we call in Hindi is known as haldi. And it has got anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-proliferative, anti-angiogenic properties. This slide has already been shown by Dr. Kastival, so I'll just skip that. But what it tells you is that if you can prevent activation of NF-kappa-B, you can prevent the release of inflammatory mediators and prevent mucosal inflammation. And this was a study that has been done that for the prevention of relapses in ulcerative colitis. There were two groups. One group was given, one group was given placebo and Salzopyrin, the other was curcumin, which is again derived from haldi, and, uh, and the salzopyrin. And you can see the relapse rate in this group was 20%, and this group is less than 5%. So clearly, in the future, we're going to see probably more trials in this drug. This is very preliminary data. I wouldn't like to bet on it yet, but this is promising, and I hope this is, turns out to be a success story for India. So ladies and gentlemen, chairpersons, 
And in summary, it's the better understanding of the pathophysiology of IBD which has led to the development of new drugs. Steroids, 5-ASA and Imuron remain the mainstay of treatment even today. The major developments that have occurred are in the management of acute severe colitis. Biologicals and cyclosporin are the standard of care for acute severe colitis, but newer drugs are very much on the anvil and we hope to see them in the near future. Thank you very much.